the legacy of Nuremberg to uh, contemporary America. Now, the events I'm referring to, of course, uh, are the, the passage of the military commissions and detainee uh, treatment legislation, which uh, went through the House of a couple of days ago and went through the Senate uh, by about a two-thirds vote yesterday, um, and will land on the President's desk, um, presumably just in time for the actual 60th anniversary of the Nuremberg Judgment. Um, now, the irony of that fact, I think, could not be greater because, as I hope to explain, uh, the bill <coughs> represents the complete repudiation of what the Nuremberg trials were about. Now, I'd actually like to begin uh, from the topic of this panel by reflecting on the curious phrase, crimes against humanity. And I want to ask a very basic question about it. Uh, who is humanity supposed to be when you talk about crimes against humanity? Now, the actual origin of the phrase, crimes against humanity, in the Nuremberg Charter is somewhat obscure. Uh, it did not appear in any of the early drafts of the, the list of crimes in the Charter, uh, which were discussed at the London Conference in June or July. Uh, the first time that it appeared was in early August, and there was really no explanation uh, in the report uh, of why the phrase appeared. Um, there had been earlier drafts uh, that used a, a different expression, the expression laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. Uh, which is a uh, phrasing that is taken from the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 is the so-called Martin's Clause, and which still exists in, in the Geneva Conventions and in U.S. military law. Now, um, that disappeared from the intermediate drafts, and there might have been good reasons for that. Um, uh, the Martin's <laughs> Clause actually doesn't have a 100% savory history itself. The reason that uh, the Hague Conventions talked about uh, actions that violate the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience was that that was a little bit of diplomatic doublespeak that was designed to break a deadlock between small countries at the Hague Conference that, uh, that wanted to heavily regulate what occupying countries could do and large countries that didn't want any regulation. So uh, Martin, uh, who was representing a large country, Russia, crafted uh, the idea of this uh, phrase to kind of fill that gap. And it was, uh, it's not a particularly savory idea. Uh, it, uh, you know, part of the problem with it is that it refers to something called the laws of humanity. And uh, the problematic concept of the laws of humanity is that as a piece of positive law, there simply are no such things. Uh, there is no world government to enact laws of humanity. Uh, there is no political community. Uh, I want to put the emphasis on the word political. No political community called humanity, although, as I want to suggest, there might be some other kind of community that we could call humanity. Now, uh, Professor Bassioni says in his treatise that uh, uh, Robert Jackson chose the term crimes against humanity after a consultation with Hirsch Lauterpacht, who was one of the great international lawyers in England, who himself lost family members in the Holocaust. And you know, one of the interesting questions is what exactly was Jackson doing there? Now, what I want to suggest is that even though the idea of laws of humanity may be incoherent as a positive law doctrine, the rhetoric of humanity is powerful. And it seems to me pretty clear that what Lauterpacht and Jackson wanted to do was to capture some of the power of that rhetoric and yoke it to positive law. So the root idea of crimes against humanity, therefore, is that attacks against civilians and civilian populations are, as Judge Wald said, uh, not just crimes against the victims. And they're not just crimes against the victim states but that they're crimes against all of humanity. And so all of humanity becomes a kind of imagined community. I've had to think of it as something akin to a Greek chorus, uh, or you know, what uh, ethical theorists call the ideal observer in ethics. Uh, and it's the fundamental interests of this imagined community that are being offended here. Now, Imagined communities are very nice, but uh, 
Um, they are, after all, imagined. So it seems to me that one of the one of the questions we need to ask is how does this get operationalized? How does this get positivized? And the way I want to suggest that it gets positivized is not just through Article 6C, the article on crimes against humanity, but through the entire idea of the Nuremberg trial. It, uh, it cashes out in two ideas. The first uh, is that contrary to the classical picture of international law, according to which the world consists of a society of states, it's a global village in the sense that it is a society that has fewer than 200 members. Uh, that classical idea is at least in part rejected. The notion of humanity suggests that contrary to this classical picture of international law, the world at bottom consists not of a society of states, but of a society of human beings. And then the second idea that operationalizes the Greek chorus is to say that government officials have responsibility that transcend the laws, orders, and ideologies of their own states. And that humanity, the Greek chorus, is entitled uh, to hold them to those responsibilities. Uh, now, that is the idea behind the Nuremberg Trials, at least as Jackson in the United States position envisaged it. It's important to remember that there was not a unanimous chorus calling for trials of the top Nazis. The initial British position was that this is a political decision. The trials would just give them a chance to grandstand, uh, and they should be rounded up and shot. The Soviet position was that a political decision had already determined that justice should be done to them, and the sole purpose of trials should be to determine the punishment, not to have a fair trial examining questions of guilt. And Jackson, in the US position, said the problem with political making this a political determination is that that is not jurisgenerative. That does not create international law. That doesn't do something to translate into legal categories this very odd idea of the imagined community of humanity. Uh, later, France and Russia objected to the idea of classifying aggression as a crime under, under international law, and they wanted to simply make it a crime when it was committed by the Axis countries. And again, Jackson and the United States objected to that. Uh, they, Jackson did not win that fight entirely. The resulting charter was a compromise in which the, the tribunal's uh, jurisdiction was limited only to the Axis countries, but nothing in the definition of the crimes limited to the Axis countries. And then finally, in 1950, when the United Nations General Assembly uh, declares that the Nuremberg Principles are international law, the American agenda of uh, trying to institutionalize and operationalize the idea of humanity uh, is fulfilled. And in particular, two of the principles of the Nuremberg Charter, uh, and it would become then the UN's Nuremberg Principles, are very important. The first, the fact that internal law national law, that is, does not impose a penalty for an act which constitutes a crime under international law, does not relieve the person who committed the act from responsibility under international law. So the fact that it's not a domestic crime doesn't mean that it's not a crime. Second, the fact that a person acted pursuant to order of his government or of a superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law, provided that a moral choice was in fact possible to him. So that takes away the defense of government orders and superior <laughs> orders. Uh, now, if you put that together with the notion that crimes against humanity can be crimes, even if they're committed by a state against its own citizens, you begin to see how this notion of humanity that comes out in the term crimes against humanity affects not just that one article, but the entire idea of Nuremberg, which is penetrating the shell of state sovereignty, uh, and showing that officials can be held to laws that are other than the laws of their own states. And that actually uh, uh, begins to manifest, manifest itself again and again in the late 40s, uh, which you might think of as, you know, part, as the axial age for the creation of international law. Uh, it's the time of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the time of the Genocide Convention. It's the time of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and it uh, is a tremendous um, efflorescence, uh, flowering of, uh, of the idea that there will be a humanitarian law 
that will govern the conduct of combatants in the future. Uh, I should say that this past summer, the last two holdouts among nations uh, adopted the Geneva Convention. So the Geneva Conventions are now the only universal treaty in the entire corpus of uh, human rights treaties. Um, one other thing that I think is very important to the Nuremberg idea, besides this idea that it should be generating international law and operationalizing the idea of humanity, is that the trials are fair. Now, I'd like to fast forward 60 years. At the end of uh, the last term, the Supreme Court in the Hamdan decision declared that the global war on terror is covered by the Geneva Conventions and specifically by Article 3, common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, it tossed out the plan for military commissions to try uh, Al-Qaeda um, grand criminals on the grounds that that violated one of the aspects of common Article 3, which is the requirement of of trials that have all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized people. Now that was the main point of the case, but by holding the common Article 3 applies to the war on terror, it meant that other articles were activated as well, specifically an article that forbids uh, um, cruel treatment and torture, and an article that forbids outrages upon personal dignity, and in particular humiliating and degrading treatment. The problem is, that uh, according to the President of the United States, if that was left untouched, it would stop the CIA's program of interrogating high value Al Qaeda detainees, which of course leaves it to our imagination what was going on in the program. Um, we've got news reports about what the seven tactics were that were used, of which about four um, at least come arguably close to violating this. I mean, that includes uh, waterboarding, a cold cell where so a naked detainee is hosed down and thrown into a 50 degree cell, long time standing, forcing somebody to stand for 48 hours while short shackled to the floor, um, and intensive sleep deprivation. Uh, now, the president said it's time that we've got to decide whether we want this program to go on or not. And the result was the current bill. Now, the bill is 96 pages long, and I'm certainly not going to go over all of its details. But I would like to discuss something about the basic strategy of the bill. It's threefold. The first is to redefine war crimes so as to exclude the CIA's <laughs> tactics from the definition of war crimes. And uh, that's an extremely intricate part of the bill, which would be a great thing for us to talk about at some point during these uh, three days. Uh, secondly, it's to grant the President of the United States unreviewable authority to interpret the Geneva Conventions. And the third is to keep the courts out of the business by stripping jurisdiction from US courts to hear detainee cases and also forbidding all arguments based on the Geneva Conventions. Now, that's the basic strategy. Uh, one of the other pieces of it, uh, this is what some, one that Judge Wald mentioned that I'd like to read to you again. One clause says, no foreign or international sources of law shall supply a basis for a rule of decision in the courts of the United States in interpreting the prohibitions enumerated in the War Crimes Act. So that means in particular, no more customary international law in the interpretation of war crimes in US jurisprudence. So those of us like myself who actually shelled out 400 bucks for the 4,000 page uh, ICRC uh, handbook on customary international law, I can now sell it on eBay. <laughs> um, if we you know, don't know what we'll get for it. Um, now, that is in some sense. We'll be a collector's item. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it might be useful for other purposes. I mean, it looks great on the shelf. Um, uh, that, I mean, put that side by side with the Nuremberg principle, the fact that internal law does not impose a penalty for an act which constitutes a crime under international law does not relieve the person who committed the act from responsibility under international law. You can see that the new bill basically says, forget that. We are not interested in international law. 
And of course what that means is not just as customary international humanitarian law not applicable, but as far as I can tell, the Nuremberg Principles are not applicable and arguments based on the Nuremberg Principles might not be acceptable uh, in the discussion of war crimes within the United States. Now, there are other substantive features of the bill that are very troubling. Uh, I'll mention one just a, in passing, and that is there is a new definition of what an unlawful enemy combatant is who can be detained without trial indefinitely. And uh, it turns out that it is anybody that the president so designates. Uh, it's one half of a definition. The other half gives a substantive standard. This half says, uh, uh, or anyone that a competent tribunal picked by the president so designates, uh, with no standard laid down for that. And, uh, the procedures for the actual military commissions, which are, I guess, the immediate, uh, I want to say, bastard progeny of uh, the Nuremberg tribunals, uh, do not stand up to the kinds of standards of fairness, I think it is fair to say, in the Nuremberg uh, trials. I'll just mention one feature of this. While evidence that's obtained by torture is forbidden, is excluded, uh, the U.S. definition of torture is very narrow, and the bill says that evidence obtained by coercion other than torture can be admissible. That's one part of it. Second, that any information about what sources the United States used to obtain information um, can be privileged and declared privileged at the declaration of the government, and that includes, I'm presuming, the fact that the evidence was obtained by coercion. So notice, uh, the defendant is allowed to argue that evidence that was, uh, I will say, tortured out of somebody, let's say through one of these tactics, waterboarded out of somebody, can't arguably be admissible. The defendant can argue against its admissibility, but the government can stop any evidence being introduced about exactly how this evidence was obtained. Okay. Now, this is something that I think would have flabbergasted Vyshinsky uh, at the time, at the time of uh, um, Nuremberg, would have uh, flabbergasted um, the most hard-boiled of the drafters of the London Charter. Um, I'd like to just re finish by returning to what seems to me the historical irony uh, that this is a bill that is produced on the 60th anniversary of Nuremberg. Uh, one of the uh, most memorable parts of Justice Jackson's opening oration at, uh, at Nuremberg was this. Uh, he said, we must never forget the, that the record on which we judge these defendants today is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. And I might say that history is another word for the imagined community of humanity. The humanity will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants a poisoned chalice is to put it to our lips as well. And I want to suggest that uh, uh, as of yesterday, the anniversary gift for the 60th anniversary of Nuremberg presented neatly gift wrapped by the United States Congress is a poisoned chalice.